A million, a million dollars to spend on the ocean. Actually, one billion dollars. Hypothetically speaking. This was the question The Economist put to five of the world's leading thinkers in ocean conservation. A billion dollars. So one billion dollars. A billion dollars. A billion do dollars doesn't go very far these days. For seven decades, Sir David Attenborough has brought the natural world into people's homes. His groundbreaking television series, Blue Planet, raised global awareness of mankind's impact on the ocean. So how would Sir David spend that one billion dollars? I would spend a bit of it on trying to persuade the nations of the world that these are the property of humanity as a whole and had to be dealt with by human beings getting together and agreeing on a policy to look after the precious things of the ocean. Countries have long disputed how the ocean should be governed, but there is a framework in place. Each coastal nation governs the water that extends 12 nautical miles from its shore, known as its territorial sea. For up to 200 nautical miles out, coastal nations have their own exclusive economic zones, where they have sovereign rights to resources like fish, oil and minerals. Beyond that, it's the high seas, a vast expanse of water owned at once by everyone and no one. A basic law of the sea does exist, and a tangle of overlapping authorities often with conflicting mandates, oversees particular activities and little consequence for nations that don't abide by it. Negotiations are underway for a new treaty to protect the biodiversity of the high seas. But to make it effective, it will need to have more teeth than its predecessors. Sir David's $1 billion could be spent on funding and demonstrating the value of multinational enforcement schemes. Yet any negotiations over the high seas face a major stumbling block, fishing rights. If I have a billion dollars, I will establish no-take zones. Zafar Kizakaya is a conservationist from Turkey. The main problem right now is the resource management. We over-exploited many things. As a result of unsustainable fishing practices, over a third of the world's fish stocks have collapsed. Mr. Kizokai has successfully convinced his government to create 3,000 hectares where fishing isn't allowed, otherwise known as no-take zones. This is the most major spawning and nursery area. So that's why we have to keep this area safe from all kinds of fishing pressure, amateur, professional, any kind. In the 10 years since Mr. Kizilkaya's no-take zone has been in place, marine biomass has increased by 800%. But there's a problem. Less than 1% of the whole ocean surface is no fishing zone. And within this 1%, probably half of them is not well enforced. Creating no-take zones is one thing, Policing them is another. Putting the marine protected areas on the paper as no fishing zone doesn't mean anything. Do we have rangers? Do we have boats? Do we have people protecting these areas from any illegal activity? Illegal, unreported or unregulated fishing accounts for one in every five fish taken from the sea. And this is where Zafar Kizilkaya would spend his $1 billion. Technology could easily help the satellite technology or high-tech drones, which can fly in really long distances. It is the most time-consuming, money-consuming part of marine conservation. That's where we need this billion dollars. But to convince the international community to create more marine protected areas requires evidence. And that means more science. So what would I do with $1 billion? As scientists, it may be a bit obvious that I would want to invest it in science. 
we do have large gaps in our knowledge that need to be filled. Dr. Suzanne Lockhart is a marine biologist with a particular interest in cold water coral. It may seem that we know a lot about the ocean, but it is the tip of the iceberg of what we need to know in order to keep our ocean healthy. Just two years ago, Dr. Lockhart became the first person to ever explore the floor of Antarctica's Weddell Sea. Antarctica has some of the densest and most diverse seabed communities you could ever see. At one, zero, two, three, over. Many thought these waters were too deep and too cold to support much life. But on this expedition, her team uncovered vast coral reefs teeming with marine life. So you've got sea stars, uh, visual star. We can learn so much from a thousand-year-old coral colony. Dr. Lockhart's research has been used as the basis for a proposal to create the world's biggest marine protected area, one million square miles in the Antarctic. With an extra $1 billion, Dr. Lockhart believes scientific research could help to protect much more of the ocean. There will always be those countries that block consensus because they claim a lack of knowledge. So if we can go into those remote areas and collect evidence, then it makes it very hard for them to dispute the fact that we need protection. The ocean is under threat as a result of human activity. Could one way of protecting it focus on how people live on land? I'd spend a billion dollar on batteries. Doug McCauley is a professor of marine biology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I know it's a little bit strange for a marine biologist to suggest batteries, but indeed, that's precisely where I put my investment. Professor McCauley has pioneered the use of technology in the conservation of some of the world's most endangered marine species. The challenge for a marine biologist is that you're doing all these things and you must do these things and they matter. And yet looming behind you is this master threat to the ocean's climate change. Climate change is causing the ocean to overheat, increasing the level of acidity and reducing the oxygen content of the water. So what could batteries do to help us fight climate change? They're essentially the most important ingredient in a low carbon future. And it's because they are the storehouses for this low carbon energy that we need to capture. The world relies on lithium ion batteries. Green technology is being developed around their use, but this type of battery requires minerals like cobalt which have a controversial supply chain. To meet the growing demand for batteries, mining companies are turning their attention to the deep sea. There's a lot of uncertainty in the ocean science community about exactly what ocean mining would do to ocean ecosystems, but I can tell you the uncertainty is about how bad mining will be for our seas, not whether it will be good. Batteries are essential to reducing CO2 emissions. Professor McCauley wants radical innovation to invest the $1 billion in designing powerful next-generation batteries, ones which won't depend on mining the sea. When we are able to come up with an alternative to a lithium-ion battery, well, then the cost of electric vehicles will come crashing down. The faster we can bring that low-carbon future to us, the more likely it is that we see a reduction in extinction in the oceans and major disruptions to ocean health. Living in an ocean-obsessed household, Doug's seven-year-old son, Finn, has his thoughts about where he'd spend the money. I'd put a million dollars. You get a billion, actually. A billion dollars to save the vaquita. The vaquita is a type of porpoise on the brink of extinction. Only 10 individuals still remain in the wild. I think you should just save them and then maybe you'd save like 30 other species that need vaquita for their food chain. 
elected by Peter Thompson is the United Nations Special Envoy for the Ocean. I'd take that billion dollars and I would direct it into education. His mission is to galvanize the international community to prioritize ocean conservation. There's a fundamental disconnect between what we know in ocean science and what the majority of the population knows. And when you think of things like every second breath of oxygen you take comes from the ocean. I mean, this should be one of the fundamental things that we are learning about in our daily life. The ocean regulates the planet's climate. It provides the main food source to nearly half the global population and underpins trillions of dollars worth of economic activity worldwide. If you give people that knowledge, they, they're going to start making the right decisions. And not just individuals, but communities, governments and international bodies have to be supplied with the right science. There is no single solution to the multitude of threats facing the ocean. And it will take more than a billion dollars to drive change. As a man-made disaster is what faces us and what we are having to deal with. Only through reshaping the way humanity lives and uses the ocean can this vital part of planet Earth be saved. And that will take not just the creativity of individuals, but the collaboration of nations. People won't care about things that they don't know about and have never seen. And that your first job is to make clear what a wonderful world the natural world is. If you'd like to find out more about some of the greatest challenges facing the ocean, and the people trying to solve them, including some of those you've just seen in this film, then please click on the link opposite. For more on the Protectors series, click the other link. Thank you for watching and please subscribe.